Well, that would be a good uh, passage to preach on right there. That's some good stuff. Uh, I'm only wanting to look just at that one verse, basically, in verse 11. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of the hearing of the words of the Lord. And so he's talking about that time coming where, where there's going to be this desire, kind of a drought, for the Word of God. And certainly in, in history, there have been times, and all throughout the Bible, there were times where uh, somebody might say God was silent during this period of time. I wouldn't say He was silent because they had some kind of Word of God they could go to, but, uh, but you understand what He means. Like when, in, in Samuel uh, chapter 3, it says there was no open vision, right? The Word of God was precious, right, in that time. And uh, we see that around, uh, they say that the intertestament test, period, between Malachi and, and Matthew, there's like 400 years, you know, where God wasn't speaking to any prophets and they weren't recording uh, the word down. I mean, I don't know exactly to what extent uh, he was, they had the, the word of God, but uh, during that time, it was like God was quiet. Can you imagine, uh, you know, you talk about a famine. We, we hardly know in, in this society what it's like to be hungry, what it's like to be thirsty, right? We, we, we don't really have that that kind of a problem, but can you imagine as a Christian to, and I guess a lot of Christians are there, I don't think anyone in this, this room probably is, but to have that, that, that starvation of the Word of God, like no words from the Lord. I, maybe you got saved, of course you need the Word of God to get saved, and you heard that got saved, but then there's just nothing, right? You go your whole life with no Word of God, I can't imagine. I mean, I've heard of places in uh, China where it's illegal for them to have the Word of God. They'll get thrown in jail if they have the Word of God. So what they do is they smuggle the Word to each other. You've probably heard, heard stuff like this. And, and maybe one little chapter at a time, and somebody will memorize it. They're in prison, right? They're in prison for having the Word of God, and they get that, and they'll memorize a chapter of it, keep it hidden, you know, discard it, uh, give it to somebody else, whatever. And, and, and they memorize that, and they just got to hold on to that Word of God in their head because that's all they're allowed to have. And, uh, and, you know, and I've heard of people, I, I don't remember who I heard this story from, but a missionary was telling that story, and he said the people, you know, he said, man, I feel so sorry for you, and I'm praying, you know, that the times will get better, and it'll be more, you'll be more fruitful like in America, where we just have the Word of God everywhere, and he was like, man, don't pray for that, because <laughs> he realized in America, that makes a lot of people uh, not not even care so much, not realize how precious the Word of God, how, 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 as far as important and needed it is. So tell me this, in a society where we can eat, you know, anybody can have something to eat. There's, there's programs out there. If someone doesn't have the money for it, there's places you can go. Man, you can scrub a couple of dishes in a restaurant, probably give you some scraps. I mean, there's no reason to really be hungry in this society. But do you know people are hungry? People are starving in this society? Uh, there's clean drinking water anywhere in this, in this, in this, in America, right? You can go anywhere, get water for practically nothing. Uh, man, drink out of somebody's hose if you have to, and you would stay alive with water. But you know, there people, they say dehydration is a really bad problem with people, right? Not drinking enough water. But in a Christian's life, what we need is the Word of God. Right. We need it more than water, more than bread. Right? Man should not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so uh, the Bible says in Amos' days there, he was prophesying that time's going to come. And actually this was a punishment, if you think about it. On the, on the Jewish people, he's saying, look, times are going to be rough. I'm going to cast you out. I'm not gonna, you're not going to hear from me. This was great punishment. And ironically, I was thinking about this while I was reading. I was thinking about the fact that do you know that a lot of quote-unquote Bible scholars today will get their information from rabbis <laughs> who are without understanding. They don't have the Word of God, right? You don't find a whole lot of uh, people that call themselves rabbis that are saved, right? <laughs> Just That's typically not the case. And so, uh, and so a lot of times those scholars will go to... You know, there are atheists who are actual textual critics who people go to as resources of how do I interpret the Bible... And we live in a society where it's like, you know, we've got every store sells the Bible, 
sells every kind of version of Bible out there, every kind of flavor that you want, every study Bible, every whatever you, you got, and, and it's just everywhere. You can pick whatever you want. A lot of people have four or five of them at their house, yet people are starving. People are without the Word of God. They're not getting it. They don't, uh, they're not taking it in. It's not doing anything for them. And so what I want to talk about this morning, and, uh, and I had mentioned this last week, that what I'm going to start doing for a little while is go over some things that I feel are very important that I would want uh, to continue on in this work. If I leave and it becomes autonomous, and these are just things that I would want to set as guidelines, and I would like to see as guidelines. And, and, I, and I don't see any reason at this point to worry about this, uh, but the topic I want to talk about today is the King James only. King James only, what is uh, that all about? Why is it important? What does it even matter? Of course, this is not going to be exhaustive, right? <laughs> because there's a whole lot of of uh, studies and obviously endless debates that could go on as a result of this. But I just want you to consider a few things here. First of all, we need pure water to live, okay? It's been said that a person can go three days without food. I mean, uh, three weeks without food. It would be hard to go three days without food. <laughs> you could go three weeks without food, you're going to make it. You're going to stay alive. You could go uh, only three three days without water. Uh, if you went three days without water, most likely that'd be the end of you, right? And of course they go on and say you can only live three minutes without air and uh, you can only live uh, uh, three hours. I skipped one, three hours in harsh conditions like freezing cold or, or the extreme heat or whatever. Uh, and, and those are like as a survival fact, okay? So typically three days without water, you know, you're, you're gone. Your body needs Water. I think something like 70% of our, our body is water, they say. And so we need water. And the Bible says that, uh, compares the Word of God to water in several cases. Let's look at a few verses. Look at Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. Look at verse 26. Ephesians 5, 26 that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Okay, I know that's not about drinking, that's more about washing, but you see there that idea of pure water that cleanses. Look at John chapter 4. Gospel of John chapter 4. Let's start with verse 7. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest, me of, uh, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, I love how he always just gets right to the point whenever he's soul winning. He said, If thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, Thou wouldest have asked of, me, of him, and he would have given unto thee living water. And the woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence hast thou uh, that, living word, wa that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him, shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into, uh, into everlasting life. And the woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water, and I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And so uh, we see throughout the Bible different references of water. And when it comes to just the truth and the gospel and the word of God, look at Revelation chapter 21. You can't talk about that idea of water and thirst without looking at Revelation 21. Revelation 21 verse 6, And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. Look at uh, verse, chapter 22 verse 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Okay? 
So I, I realize that we're talking more about just take about Jesus and what he has to offer in salvation. But where do we get that? We get that from his word. That's important, right? It's the incorruptible seed. It's what we need, Amen. right, in order to know Jesus and have Jesus. <clears throat> Even in uh, uh, when, when Jesus is being tempted by Satan, what's he do? He quotes scripture. I think that's, a, that's amazing, right? So uh, in Matthew 4, Four, he's talking about bread, right? I mean, we're talking about water, but still another thing. And, and it's just the idea of something that we need for survival, you know, to, to live off of. Matthew 4, 4, but he answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Okay, so number one, we need pure water to live. Now, God provides us with pure water. Now use your imagination. I'm talking about his word. He provides you with what he need, what you need to live. He provides you. And why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't he? This is why I don't understand people that believe in a God, but they don't believe in the Bible. They don't believe there's, that anybody knows who that God is. There's a God out there, but he hasn't revealed himself to us. Well, what in the world would be the point? <laughs> I mean, well, you know, <laughs> he, he, he has a, a reason for us being here. And for some reason, he needs to express that reason for us being here. So how does he do that? Through the Word, Amen. right? And, of course, Jesus is called the Word, and uh, he's an expression of God to us. And so, uh, so God provides us with pure water. Now, in case you just thought I was thirsty, which I am, I brought some things here. And so if I was thir any part of the world... Okay, any part of the world you go to, you know, they would love to have this to stay alive. Now, look, somebody's going to come up to you and say, yeah, well, you know, they didn't get all the fluoride out of there. And so it's still going to cause problems. <laughs> or somebody's going to say, yeah, but when they filtrate that, they get around too many uh, uh, minerals and all that. We need to have that in there. Look, if I'm needing to live, I'm drinking water. <laughs> right? And if it's the best water I can find, the purest water I can find, that's what I'm drinking, right? I trust, I believe 100% that God would give us the purest water, the perfect water. And I can show you verses in the Bible where I think he makes that clear that he's given us uh, the perfect word, word of God, right? And so I believe that he's done that. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. And of course, I believe that is with the King James Bible. But, uh, but God has always communicated with his people, all right, at the right times, He's given them what they needed, and they, as he speaks to the prophets, right, or as the prophets speak, as they're inspired by the Holy Ghost, then it would be written down and recorded, right? People would have that forever, right? And his words are not going to fail. His words are not going to perish. So they would have that. Every time his, somebody would need communication, they need to know something from God, he gave it to them at the appointed time, at the right time he gave it. Now, we live in an interesting time, thankfully. We have the complete Word of God. We have the records of everything that's happened through all history that God wanted us to know about in, in, the, in the Bible. <clears throat> Let me show you what I mean by that. I don't believe we can walk around today and see people performing just these miracles by God, like, like we see in the Bible. I know there's people that claim to do that, and I do certainly believe that God does miracles, Right? I believe that we can pray, and if it's his, we're praying for his will. If he wants to heal somebody, he'll heal it. You know, uh, I think that we should do that. We should go to somebody, have them pray over us. You know, uh, yeah, that, those are good things that the, that the Bible uh, would have us to do. But I don't believe that you can see people going around and doing some of these miracles uh, that they did in the Bible. I don't believe that a pillar of, of uh, cloud, a pillar of fire is going to come out and just begin to start leading his people, right? They're here, just whenever it moves, you know, you're just going to follow it. And whenever it stops, comes, that's you're going to set up camp. It's not going to happen again. But that doesn't mean that we're not living that experience every time we read it in the Bible. You see what I'm saying? So we get, the Bible says all those things happen as an example to us. So we look back uh, and see all the things that happen in the Bible. So you say, well, do you believe in miracles? Of course I do. I believe the Bible and I see all kinds of miracles. Oh, yeah, well, let me see one right now. Now, it doesn't work that way. God, that was the time that God had finished. Uh, he needed those things, right, to deal with his people, to lead his people. Now we have records of that, and we look back. 
I, I, I hope, okay, everyone on the same page, you, you think that's what happened? And, and here's an example, because there are a lot of people uh, that believe, and the whole, uh, I know, Pentecostal charismatic movement is, uh, is really big on, hey, you, don't, you need more than just this. You need some kind of sign to confirm what you believe, okay? But if you, if you compare Scripture to Scripture, and you see, even in the early writings of Paul, he's talking about different miracles, different signs, and all that in his later letters, it's no longer like that. It's all about just going to the Word of God. It's all about going to, uh, you know, you can go to the, the elders and have them pray, you know, if, if you're sick or whatever. But there's not like, he, put your hand on them and heal. In fact, the only time after a certain point, it seems like all that's done away with. You don't see any miracles until you see the talk about the Antichrist in Revelation. Then he comes and he's tricking people into believing that he can do all these miracles and he's leading people astray, right? So I think it's clear that, it, that, and it just makes sense that God stopped that because, as Peter said, we have a more sure word of prophecy, right? You preached that. I don't remember if you preached that here or if that was just in Iola whenever you were talking about that. Uh, but what a great point about how he was talking about Gideon and different people in the Bible who were trusting in a sign. They wanted to see a sign. And the truth of the matter, and I've told people this uh, many times who tell me, oh, well, I believe in God because some great experience that happened to him. And I was like, well, according to the Bible, the person who never had that happen to him and still puts their faith in God's word, the Bible says that impresses God more than a person who's trusting in some experience, all right? Because I'm not just going to tell someone to their face who, who thinks some kind of situation happened. I'm not going to just say, no, no, that didn't happen. You're a liar, all right? But I'm just saying, well, let's not even worry about that. Right. If that didn't happen, would you still believe the word of God? Because the Bible says, blessed is he who believes who has not seen, all right? So God has given us his word and he expects us, by, expects us by faith to trust that he's given us that word. Truth of the matter is, whenever I open up this bottle of water, I don't really know. Somebody might have injected something in it, <laughs> right? Might have picked up some kind of bacteria. I don't really know. I'm just pretty much by faith just trusting this is pure water. I believe it's pure water. The person that gave it to me, I'm trusting the company that sold it to me. I'm trusting the manufacturer, all that that it's going to be pure water, right? And I believe, obviously, all illustrations fall short, but I believe God has given us His uh, uh, pure Word of God. Amen. Now, number three, we need, water to, we need pure water to live. God's provided us with pure water. Number three, I believe there will always be pure water. If God gave us the pure water, right, he, he's, it's always going to be available. He's not going to give us pure water and then let it just go away or take it away or whatever, and then you're going to go this long period of time. What happened to that water that we once had? Does that make sense? So when he gives us his word, right, that's the, word of God, uh, that's the precious word of God, the pure water, if you will, that we need. He's not going to take that away from us. And uh, Matthew, all the Olivet Discourse verses, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, they say, Heaven and earth, Jesus says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. When he said that, uh, he, I, I believe he meant from, from here on, all right? And there's other passages, everything that happened before Jesus, you know, that, that was uh, sealed too. That's, that's not going anywhere. That's not going to pass away either, okay? And it's crazy to me that people would believe that God at one point gave his word. He gave everybody his, uh, his word, what they, his inspired word, and then he, gave, he told them about these signs and these miracles and all this. And he says, uh, now I've given you a more sure word of prophecy. And you can look back on that and you can know everything that you need to know. And then it would hide in a cave for hundreds and hundreds of years. Right. Or it would just like, nobody has it. Where did it go? Right? It doesn't make sense. The only copy of the word of God is chained to the monastery pulpit somewhere. Right? And, uh, and if you want it, you need to go there. That's the only way. No, I bet you it was somewhere else, right? And I bet you over time uh, we will find out that men of God have always had those manuscripts, you know, recorded and passed down to them so that they can read it. And God's worked out, you know, I don't have time to get into all the process by which we got the, the, the King James Bible, but God has worked out something so amazing. And I love this fact about uh, about the, the, collect, the process by which the Bible was, was received, okay? 
It wasn't like at any time somebody just came out of their basement and said, hey, look what I found. God gave me this word, right? If that was the case, we would say, uh, how do we know we can trust this guy, right? It didn't happen like that. It wasn't even a group of people. Some church, you know, a group of 70 men got together and just wrote something down and then came out and said, look what we got. It wasn't like that, right? I know you can say that about the translation, but here's the thing. Do you know even the translators, King James translators even, had checks and balances? It's not like they went into the separate rooms, did their little deal. And can't, you know, that's the story about the Septuagint, the fictitious story that's out there that, that the 70 men got together and uh, they all went to separate rooms and uh, wrote, wrote different things. And then when they got together, uh, they looked and, whoa, they're exactly the same. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard that or not. And so uh, uh, that really never happened in the, as far as people having the Bible. And so what happened was, you think about in Acts 6 where, um, where the disciples are saying, you know, we just don't have time to wait on tables and to do all that stuff, right? Uh, we need someone else to do that for us because we've got to be about uh, ministering the Word of God, right? So obviously that has to do with preaching, teaching, all that stuff. But you know what else they were doing? They didn't have the internet. They didn't have uh, email. They didn't have typewriters. They didn't have anything. They were copying scripture, you know, over and over so they can send it with this person, so they can send it with that person. So what happened over the years and as Christianity spread and, and uh, there was persecution and it went all over the world, they began finding manuscripts on all parts of the world. And when you put them together, they matched up, right? That's what they call the... Uh, the majority text, or, I mean, all these, or the received text. They said, oh, you know, if I were to write a letter to my, my wife and uh, a whole bunch of people copied that letter and passed it around, right, and somewhere down the line, we're trying to figure out which one is the closest to the, the original, you know what we would do? We would take all of those writings together and we would probably assume that if there was one that had a mistake in it, that that one was probably wrong, <laughs> right? But all those other ones that are great, this guy must have messed up, and so he didn't write that in there. But all these others are, are, are true. And so what men did was they took all those manuscripts, and they put them together, and they compared them, and they came out with what was, uh, what they, you know, I mean, people had multiple, uh, m multiple copies of them, but I'm just saying over time, they checked it up with, with other uh, manuscripts that were around, and, uh, and you know the process of eventually uh, there being some rough drafts. And then uh, in 1611, you know, it was kind of like the final draft. Well, uh, it depends on how you look at it. I guess, uh, I guess 1769 could have been the final draft. But, uh, but so this process was going. But the Word of God was there. It was pure. Now, let me tell you this. There will always be pure water out there but you know what for some people pure water is going to be hard to find you could go to parts of this world in africa india places in south america and they can't just go to the store and pick this up they can't even go and just have a water fountain that they can just trust to drink in in fact if you go visit another country third world country they're going to say don't drink the water <laughs> right? you drink that water you're going to get some kind of bug you're going to get sick it might even kill you if you get a really bad one. So, so this water, it's not coffee, all right? This represents like, you know, you dig something out of the, out of the dump or whatever, all you can find to use as a container, right? And then you, you get down there into the nasty, dirty water, and that's all you've got to drink. Don't look at me like I'm going to drink it. I'm not going to drink it. I got, I, got, I got good water right here, right? <laughs> Y'all look at me like, is he going to do it? No way. <laughs> but, you know, if I was dying, I would. You know, right. if, I was, if I was so thirsty, I thought I was going to pass out. If I, I would drink that in a heartbeat, not even think about it. Right. I might run it through my shirt first or something, try to get it as clean as I can. But I would drink it. Right. And there are parts of the world. I talk to missionaries all the time who say uh, even even surprisingly, when you talk to somebody about the Spanish Bible, You'd say, now the Spanish Bible, they've got to have somewhere the perfect word of God for the Spanish-speaking people. I mean, the King James translators use the 1602, right? Uh, Antigua, they use that even in some of their references. So it was around, it must have been completely pure. 
and yet you ask a, a, a missionary um, on the field in Mexico if they have the perfect word of God, and they'll say, we don't have the perfect word of God. In other words, I've not found anything. Uh, I realize this, some people are going to you know, have difference of opinions on this, but I've not found anything that compares perfectly to the King James. And so they'll say, I just don't think then that there's a perfect one out there, you know, that's in Spanish. That's what, uh, that's what people say. And so they're still searching, and I'm like, wow, man. It's just kind of like the real water situation. You go to a third world country, and man, why don't they have good water, right? Yet in America, we got clean drinking water everywhere. It's so, it's so easy, uh, but I'm going to get ahead of myself. <clears throat> so for some people, the Word of God is very, very precious, and uh, and they really uh, they really would will take whatever they can have really. So that brings up an interesting question because you know there are people out there that say, you know, man, if you don't have the King James Bible, you can't be saved, right? If you don't use the King James Bible, you can't be saved. Well, if that's true, you got people all over this world then who aren't saved, who have been thinking that they're saved because they had the Bible, they had the Bible, right? And so you say, well, then that's an interesting situation because. If it's got to be the Word of God, you know, how do we know that we can believe that, that somebody got saved by the Word of God? Well, guess what? This has a lot of good water in it. And if you drank that, you'd probably survive, you know. It's just dangerous. It could have some bad stuff mixed in it, right? If, if, if I, uh, we were, we were uh, uh, knocking doors the other day, and I can't remember exactly what I said, but I'm going to use this for an example because it was something a lot like this. And I'm quoting like uh, uh, John 3.16, and I say, uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not, have, shall not perish, but have eternal life. So I'm saying, hey, it's supposed to be everlasting, right? I don't think that person can get saved because you just messed up that word. <laughs> If that's the case, I've sent a lot of people to hell because I've misquoted scripture a lot whenever I'm giving them. Now, look, that's a dangerous thing to do. I don't want to do that. I want to get it right. But do you see what I'm saying? It can still be the word of God and have some, uh, some minor mistakes in it. <clears throat> so many languages all over the world, that's kind of what they're dealing with, right? They're dealing with uh, the best that they have, right? And, uh, and thankfully... Uh, people can kind of compare versions and they can compare to the King James even and they can come out with the best they can. But so many missionaries have, will say this language still doesn't have a perfect Bible. Uh, so they're using the best version that they can. So here's the problem. In America, in the English speaking language, and uh, I'm sure other languages, but that's all I know is the English speaking language. We, we have, and we've had it for over 400 years, We've had the perfect Word of God, and it's just everywhere. We can go anywhere to get it. We can go to a dollar store and get it for a dollar, right? How many guys get the, the dollar store Bible? It's, this print's a little bit small, but it's, it's, it's the Bible, right? I remember kids in Bible college would call up, I don't suggest you do this, but they would call up the Mormons and get a King James Bible from <laughs> <laughs> or the Gideons or whatever. They were just anywhere. There's Bibles everywhere. You know, you can go to uh, all kinds of places and get uh, King James Bibles. But you know what? Some people, let me go through this again. So we need pure water to live. God provides us with pure water. There will always be pure water. For some, pure water is hard to find. Here's number five. Some people don't want pure water. Some people don't want pure water. I get dehydrated sometimes because I drink a lot of coffee, and that's like all I drink. <laughs> if I'm not careful, i got to remember to go drink uh, water. In fact, the rule of thumb, I believe you should drink as much pure water as you do coffee. So, you're, <laughs> you know, any hydration you're getting from the coffee, you're going to get more, but I think you should drink as much uh, uh, pure water. And that's why I, I use the illustration, too, if you... If you listen to a lot of preaching, read a lot of commentary, hear man's ideas, we know man's fallible, so there's going to be some mistakes in that. So I would recommend you spend equal amount of time just reading the plain word of God from the King James Bible and just, and just read that. That's like the pure stuff, right? And that'll keep you hydrated. But some people don't want pure water, even if it's available. 
uh, they want something that I was going to just get like a Coke or something like that, but I didn't have time to buy it, and, and this is what I found, okay? But uh, uh, I've never actually had this, but this is a Mango Loco Monster Juice, Monster Energy Juice, probably yeah, keep, you, keep you awake on the ride home. Got, it's got 110 calories, got, uh, let me see here, how much sugar? I hope I didn't grab a sugar free because that'll mess up my illustration. Uh, sugar is 28 grams per serving, two servings per container, but that's what people want, see? They want the caffeine, give them a buzz, they want the sugar, makes them feel good, tastes good to their mouth, right? They want something uh, that, that is just, they're bored of water, they're sick of water, right? It's boring. We don't understand that old King James, the these and the thous and all that stuff. I don't want to think about that. Give me something uh, uh, that's, that's sweet to the taste. Look at Isaiah chapter 30. I think this can apply here. Isaiah chapter 30. Look at verse 8. Now go, write it before them in a table, and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, See not, and to the prophets, Prophesy not unto us, write things, Speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Isn't that the cry that we get? It's like, no, say smooth things. Say the things that I want to hear, <laughs> right? I, can't, I just always think about the story of uh, Ahab and is it Jehoshaphat? And uh, they're gathered around wanting to go to battle and they're like, Asking all the prophets. They got 400 prophets there. They're like, oh, yeah, go to battle, go to battle. God told us, you'll win. And Jehoshaphat said, I just don't think, uh, forgive me if I'm using the wrong name, but he said, I just don't think uh, something's not right here. I think we ought to go, is there any other prophet? And he was like, yeah, there's this one, Micaiah, but I hate him. <laughs> he never prophesies what I want him to prophesy. And he says, well, let's go get him, right? And the guy goes and gets him, and he's saying, okay, now look, all these prophets are telling him what he wants to hear, just tell him what he wants to hear. So he gets up before the king and he's like, okay, sure, go to battle. And he's like, why won't you tell me the truth? Tell me the truth. And he's like, all right, here's the truth. If you go to battle, you're going to die. He gets mad. See, I told you he never prophesies anything that I want. <laughs> I love that that story is in the Bible because that's exactly how people are. Right. Preach the truth, man. We want to hear the truth. And then you preach the truth and they're like, oh, I just don't know why you got to be so offensive and why you got to be... <laughs> Talk to people all the time about the, uh, uh, you know, we just bring up because it's such a hot topic in our society. So we'll bring up the homosexual agenda. And you bring that up, Christians will come out of the woodwork and be like, oh, well, you just can't, you shouldn't say that. You're going to offend people. You need to stop talking. And you're like, well, do you think that it's okay? Oh, no, no, it's a sin, right? But you just got, you don't want to offend. You want to be careful how you, you can't have it both ways. <laughs> right? You either stand up for the truth and say, here's what the Bible says. This is wrong. And they say, oh, yeah, well, do you also preach against adultery? Yes, I do. <laughs> what about fornication? Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, well, you mix fabrics? <laughs> shut up. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> People will do anything they can to shut you down and to, and to get you quiet because they just want to hear smooth things, things, that'll, uh, 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 things that feel good, like loco mango or whatever it is. <clears throat> so the fact of the matter is the word of God is out there it's available uh, I'm going to tell you uh, here in a second some reasons why we accept the King James as the only pure word of God and I'm not going into this long you know I don't think I have to take you through a nine you know course uh, lesson to show you how we got it and what manuscripts are bad and all that I think we know first of all well, let me just jump into it. First of all, there's no surprise that Satan wants to pervert the Word of God. 
Genesis 3.1, what's, what's Satan say? He says he's more subtle than any of the beasts, right? So what's he say to uh, Eve? He's like, yea, hath God said, right? Cast in a little bit of doubt, you know. He knows the word of God. He's, 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 not, he's subtle, man. He's, he's wise. He's sharp. In fact, Jesus, he's tempting Jesus in the wilderness. What's he, what's he do? He quotes scripture to him, right? And, and Jesus has to say, yeah, but it's also, <laughs> the word of God also says, right? It's also been written. He has to combat him because he's quoting scripture to him. He's saying, hey, why don't you do that? Doesn't the Bible say this and this and this? And, you know, that's how people are, man. They take little parts of the Bible, they memorize certain things, and they'll just twist it, and they'll make it say whatever, right? But, uh, but we know that Satan has got an agenda. He wants to pervert the Word of God. Why wouldn't he? Amen. Right? That's the best way uh, to stop the Word of God from going on. So, so what's he going to do, man? He's going to try to taint the water. He's going to try to muddy it up. He's going to try to uh, take stuff out of it, put stuff into it, and mess it up the most that he can. Now, here's the interesting thing. As far as I know, as far as I know, King James only is King James only is it's a relatively new uh, term because it used to just be like, you know, King James Bible was the Holy Bible. It wasn't like I'm King James only. So some people will throw that at you and be like, well, don't you know that the King James only movement started with the Seventh Day Adventists in such and such date? And you're like, well, it, I mean, before that, though, when people had it, they just accepted this was the word of God. Now, I realize when it first was translated, there were some that had a hard time giving up their Bible, but look, their Bible was a really good Bible too, right? It was just, it just needed some, uh, uh, it just needed to be polished up and edited a little bit. And so, but that's not what people are doing today with the Bible. They're not like polishing up and editing it. And actually, I wouldn't trust anyone to do that, okay? But, uh, but they're actually changing it to different manuscripts, all right? But that's another story. So the King James only is, uh, are really the only ones that claim that they have the pure word of God. Did you know that? Like everybody, I've never heard somebody say, well, my NASB is the perfect pure word of God. And it's the standard by which we measure every other Bible. No, it's always like compared to the King James, right? As the standard. Right. And uh, NIV, ESV, all these people will say like they have the best. But if you say, is that the perfect word of God? Well, no. You know, they'll say something like, well, I'll get you four or five different versions and you've got the Word of God. <laughs> you know, I guess you're just supposed to read all of them. And, but if you ever listen to, one, to a guy who preach like that, though, he'll just pick out whatever verse is convenient out of whichever Bible he has. Why? Because he wants to preach the smooth words, yep. right? So he'll pick out which one works the best for his message. But we don't believe that. We believe that God gave us his Word. We'll read it. Look, if the words are kind of hard to, to understand because... Uh, they're a little old. We don't use those words every day. Guess what we do? We go get a dictionary. Amen. You don't even really have to get an 1828 dictionary. <laughs> you can pretty much just go dictionary.com. What does this word mean? I mean, that's what I do all the time uh, on, the, on Google. I guess dictionary.com is what they use. And I just say such and such. Uh, a lot of times they do etymology. So it not only gives a definition, but all the like background, how the word came about or whatever. And by the time I read that, I know what that word means, even in the King James Bible. <laughs> and that's what you would do if you were trying to study a mechanics manual and you wanted to learn about names of parts of your car that you've never heard before. You'd have to look it up, right? That doesn't mean the word's archaic and not, a, you know, not useful anymore. You just got to do a little bit of a study, but it's still English. You can still understand it. <coughs> and we believe it's the perfect word of God. We don't believe that, uh, you know, Somebody's going to unearth some manuscript out of a cave or out of the ground sometime or out of a trash can in the monastery or whatever and say, oh, look, I believe this is older than what we have, so therefore it must be better. Maybe it was corrupt, and so that's why they threw it in the trash can. <laughs> right? yeah, right. So, uh, and I know some guys who uh, debate on that issue, which would get really mad at me saying that because they say that it wasn't in a trash can, but it's another story for another day. <clears throat> So one of the reasons that we use King James only is because really the modern version movement is pretty new. I mean, there are, there are other languages that have several versions of the Bible available. Uh, we talked about the Spanish Bible. It's got a lot of different versions. Most of them are, are, are pretty close to identical, right? But, uh, but they have a, in, in 1960, they came out with a version that's kind of more like the, 
the manuscripts that the new the NIV uses and stuff like that. So so uh, but relatively new, like you know, it wasn't until like the 60s where you just started seeing boom, 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 all these versions versions of the Bible start popping up, right? And so that's a relatively new thing. Uh, and and here's the thing. They're all they're basing this off of newfound evidence and like textual criticism and these so-called scholars who, if you ever listen to them, they're so full of themselves and they think they know everything better than everybody else. And I just don't trust them. Right. <clears throat> Here's the other thing. You study the background of what some of these people believe. I already mentioned some of them are are Jews and don't even believe in Jesus. So we know that they don't know the word of God. Some of them are. Um, uh, atheists, we've already talked about that, and some of them just have heretical doctrines, and they teach very, they believe very dangerous things, right? And then they come out with a version and say, this is the closest to the originals. I'm like, ah, you know, you say so. <laughs> I'm going to stick with what I've got. <clears throat> Here's another reason, reason I, I uh, trust the King James Bible. The love of money is the root of all evil, 1 Timothy 6.10, right? If Satan, we know Satan has an agenda to pervert the word of God. We also know that that love of money, man, everything you see wrong, every evil you see in this world, you start tracing it back up, oh, love of money, <laughs> love of money. So why do they put out a new Bible every month? <laughs> Bible of the month club, you know, subscribe, you know, we thought we had the best Bible, but the next year, nope, this is the new and improved version, right? Why? Because they're going to get you to, to update every year and spend more money and uh, get the study Bible and get all the notes and get all this, this kind of stuff. And slowly, not only are you, you know, are they making money, but the devil's getting his way and, and get, keeping people uh, from that. I like what Brother uh, Stevie said one time. He was talking about, you know, I like to have Bibles. This one is my other Bible. They don't have any kind of uh, commentary in there or, or notes. You know, you just read, you're just reading the Word of God. Uh, and he said that, you know, uh, when he was a kid and he'd have a Bible that has all these like stories off to the side or special notes, he's like, I always would be drawn to read those. And I would never actually get my Bible reading done because I'm reading all these extra little comments that are in the Bible. Why do you think, you know, it's, it's like that's by design. <laughs> Satan knows what he's doing. He's, he's crafty, okay? So the King James, the final reason is this, and again, I'm not even going into all the deep controversies, you know, and debates regarding the, the uh, manuscripts, but uh, that's a, that can be uh, hashed out at another time. <clears throat> but the King James Version also has produced great, great fruit over 400 years' time, producing missionaries, souls being saved. Uh, I, mean, I mean, pretty much, pretty much the root of those who are going out, preaching the gospel, getting the job done. King James, um, they use the King James Bible. It's produced the fruit. I'm going to trust it. I'm going to trust it. Now, I, I, I know that I'm in good company and everybody in here believes, you know, King James only. But the thing is, for those who don't, it's just kind of like looking at that and being like, well, I don't know. You know, I just think, how do I know fluoride's not in there? I think I see some little floaties, you know, or something. I, I don't know if it's good. So what are you going to do, starve to death? No, what are you going to do, pick this up? Say, I think I'll go with this, right? <laughs> I'll go with the uh, the uh, uh, good news for modern man. I don't even does anybody even use that version anymore. The Message Bible, right? And uh, has it got any truth? I don't think those do have any truth in them. But uh, uh, but you know, you could get some uh, some good out of some versions of the Bible as far as uh, you know the parts that are parts that are the Word of God. People stick with this. Say, man, that's really what I want. I'm not trusting that. Now, I'll say if you go to a third world country, they'll say don't drink the water. A lot of people will get Coke. Did you know that? They'll order Coke because almost every country has Coke. It's been bottled. They can trust it or whatever. But, man, could you imagine doing that? How long would you be there before you're like, I need some water. I need some good, pure, clean water. And I don't know if you've ever spent time reading other versions of the Bible. I'm not saying you have to or should or anything like that. But if you ever spend some time like studying that, comparing scriptures or whatever, it's, you just feel like, man, I just need to get that out of here. <laughs> just read the Word of God for a little while. And so, uh, so that is uh, just some of my reasonings for why I'm King James only. Now, let me say this. This is pretty much my policy. This is the, the policy that I have for that. There are different extremes of, of, of policies on the King James issue, okay? Some may be too soft. Some may be uh, too harsh. Here are my policies. 
obviously we only use the King James Bible for preaching, teaching, reading in the church, unless, you know, I'm wanting to point out an error in another version. I might have somebody read, read that. Uh, I remember hearing a preacher one time take, uh, here's another good reason to, to at least all be in agreement on one Bible, is because uh, I heard this preacher, he gave all these different people different versions of the Bible, took them to one verse or maybe a chapter or something and said, everybody start reading at the same time, and it was just chaos. I mean, if people are all saying different things. And then he, he said, everybody read out of the King James, and are all reading in unison. You can understand what they're saying. It's decent, and it's in order. And, uh, and that's the way it should be. We should never, like, uh, look for a better version. I mean, even if we did believe that, but we, but we, we believe King James only. But uh, number two, this, no one will be allowed to preach who does not hold to a King James only position. Some people actually, I know no one in here probably does, but some people actually think that's really radical. I had a, a friend that graduated from, uh, uh, from Heartland. Heartland didn't teach him this, okay, but when he left, uh, he kind of left the, the King James uh, mindset and started becoming a textual critic. And then he made it his mission to try to convert everybody. I mean, he's going and just talking to everybody. And I remember one time talking to me, and, he, and some missionaries got kicked off the field because they weren't King James only. And he just started telling everybody how evil that is. And these good men of God, you're, you're denying them to do what they want to do because they're not King James only. And I remember trying to defend uh, the people that, that said, hey, if they're not King James only, we're not going to have them. And he said, are you telling me, that if I came to your church and I promised I'm only going to use the King James Bible, right, uh, even though I don't believe that that's the only one, if, if you, are you trying to tell me that I wouldn't be allowed to preach? And I said, that's right, you wouldn't be allowed to preach, right? If you don't believe that the King James Bible is the inspired word of God, you wouldn't be able to. Now, what I didn't say is that you couldn't come, all right? Uh, we will not promote or make available any resources that use other versions. Uh, but here's the deal. If a visitor or someone comes in, and they're new to the whole Bible controversy or, or uh, you know, they just don't know the whole argument. Or, and maybe I don't even know anything about them. I'm not going to, like, you know, just jump them. Right? <laughs> Sit down and, what are you doing with that? Get that out of here, right? I don't know the situation. I don't know what their, what, what their background is, what they've been told. <clears throat> I'm not of the persuasion that uh, you come in using a different version. That means you're not even saved. I don't believe that. I believe they can be saved. Now, Obviously, there's a lot of there's a lot of corruption in there. There's a lot of but there are verses in there that match up identically to the verses that we use knocking doors, right? Uh, they mean the same thing. They say the same thing, uh, but there's just a lot of dangerous stuff in there. Okay, but uh, but if they came in, uh, I've been in churches where they would uh, trade Bibles with them, right? <laughs> Hey, let me give you a King James. You give me that Bible. And then after they leave, they'd throw it away. I don't do that because sometimes, like, Grandma gave them that Bible, right? And I don't want to, like, end up it coming back on me. Hey, if you feel like, if you make that deal with them, that's your own deal. But, <laughs> but my policy is that if a visitor comes in, they're not going to be kicked out or condemned for having that. But they should be provided with some information on our policy and told why we believe that that's dangerous and why we use what we use. And bottom line, they should be willing to come and at least acknowledge that we are King James only. Does that make sense? Because here's what we don't want. Here's another policy. If a person insists that the King James has errors and they start wanting to go around teaching everybody that and telling them that, then they've got to go. And that's not just because I want to be ugly and I want to be, you know, throw my weight around or something like that. It's because I believe that that could be a very dangerous situation. And I've seen it ruin a lot of churches and cause a lot of problems. And so at that point, if they are unwilling to, uh, to just get on, on board and say, hey, I won't, I'm not going to teach that then. I would like to learn why you think King James only is the right way. <clears throat> at some point, then they would just have to leave if they're persuading other people. <clears throat> Excuse me. So anyway, that's, uh, that's kind of how I feel <clears throat> on the King James only uh, issue. <clears throat> and at some point, I would like to... Uh, put more material online, you know, maybe a video or something like that on this issue. And uh, maybe it has to be really good, but make maybe 10 minutes or something like that and make that available online so that if that ever comes up, you know, we can, we can lead them to that. <clears throat> or some other resource to give them to would be great. But I do think it's important. And I started with that because of the fact that all of the doctrines that we believe, we don't base on a man's teachings, we base on the Word of God. 
So we got to start with the right source. <clears throat> and so uh, that's where I stand. Lord, love you. Thank you for your word. Certainly we don't want to get to a point in our life where we are in a famine for the word of God. And we know that it can happen even in a, in a place where uh, millions of King James Bibles are being sold every day. And, and, uh, and certainly one of the most popular books uh, sold today. Certainly the most popular book of all times. And, uh, and it's so readily available. <clears throat> Everybody has cell phones in their pocket. They can pull it up and they can, they can look at it. And yet I feel like uh, in our nation... Uh, there is a famine for the Word of God. Help us never have that. <clears throat> Help us not trust uh, uh, the Word of God that would be muddied or altered or corrupted, uh, but just to, by faith, trust what you've given us and, uh, and get to, to understand it better and to know it better so that we could be more effective in ministering and doing the work you've called us to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.